I think you have to believe you're going to be successful even when you maybe you, you have feel you're not being. Uh, I do think that uh, winning is a mindset and succeeding is a mindset. Uh, so is failure. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know what success is. Maybe it's not accepting failure. Um, the two of them are so close to each other. Mm. Um, um, so they, they have a saying in Ireland that uh, um, a pat on the back uh, is only a short distance away from a kick in the arse. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of EOpreneur. My name is Neil Zavala, your host. As always, I have the pleasure, the honor, uh, the fun break that I get to do once a week to chat to interesting entrepreneurs from the organiz uh, entrepreneurs organization around Europe. And today we're going to Ireland. So would you guys like to introduce yourselves real quick? Well, my name is Mark Foran. Um, I live in Dublin. I'm married to Barbara. I've uh, got three uh, older teenage girls. Um, I run a business called uh, Glenline Telecoms. We're in the tele telecommunications industry and we provide services to mobile phone operators in terms of uh, building out networks. And uh, we also have a small subsidiary over in Malaysia, which actually owns and operates uh, tower infrastructure uh, in that country. So that's what I've been doing for the last um, 22, 20, 23 years. Um, and I joined the EO uh, about four years ago. Amazing. But you'll have to tell us the connection between Dublin and, and Malaysia, but that being a second. <laughs> what about you? Share it with us. Me, John, yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm married to Angela, married a long time, three grown-up kids. I have a group of companies, uh, contract manufacturing, one company uh, uh, manufacturing pet food, uh, one company uh, building the cloud, uh, through servers and one company making high tech uh, food food manufacturing, so products like sports nutrition and food for special medical needs. You're like a mini mini Amazon in Dublin. Uh, I'm a mini something. <laughs> yeah. make money from <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's always interesting to me. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but a big part of my entrepreneurial journey in the last four or five years actually comes um, after being in Dublin for the first time, spending time with EO members and listening to some Irish people tell amazing stories. And it I took met, me on a journey. I met you that day um, a few years ago. Uh, I was there for your storytelling uh, masterclass. So, uh, yeah, I met you then. First time I met you, I think. So, so yeah, so for me, I know there's something about Dublin uh, and I always remember, you know, it's like there was a life-changing moment coming into Dublin and then everything changed. How did you end up doing a business about telecommunication and ending up in Malaysia? Like, what's, what's your journey here? Well, I, I like to tell people that it was a, a kind of dartboard at the, at the Atlas, but that's not really the case. It, it, and it is a very strange one, but um, we were working for Nokia in Ireland. They were one of our big uh, customers in Ireland and uh, I had a very good relationship with them and they had a big project in Malaysia and um, they, they asked us to go out. So it was kind of an invitation to, to, to go out to Malaysia and uh, bring expertise out there and grow expertise out there. And, you know, and it went well. And, you know, I've been out there 11 years now and I've had some good years and some not so good years. But, uh, you know, you, we kind of morphed from, the, you know, doing services for Nokia into owning the towers um, that the telecommunications equipment is on. So that's where, we, where we've ended up now, you know, so... Um, no, it's been good. I've I've enjoyed going out out, out to Malaysia. It's it's tough going backwards backwards and forwards, but uh, but I've enjoyed it. You know. How was it like growing up in Dublin as as people with an entrepreneurial mindset? I'm very intrigued. How is it different? How was it growing up in in Dublin? Um. um well, well, for me, 
where where my mindset came from my my father was a con, was a contractor so from that point of view i'd always been brought up in, in a in a household where um you know owning your own business or paddling your own canoe or doing your own thing was always part of, part part of it you know so I kind of always knew that, you know, I went to college and did an engineering degree, but I always knew that I was never going to do really pure engineering, that I was going to end up on the on the contracting a, a, a side of things, you know. So um, from that point of view, you know, that's that's where 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 I ended up, you know. But, um, so, you know, I started I started this business in 1999 just as, you know, uh, 2G, 3G was starting to take off and, you know, there was a demand for, um, you know, uh, companies to go out and, and, and build the networks, you know. So, you know, we've done, two, we, at this point now, we've done 2G, 3G, 4G, and we're, you know, building out the 5G networks in, in Ireland now, you know. Amazing. Oh, I wonder. I wonder how many G's you're going to achieve by the time you go on pension. I, I think um, that I think this is my last G. Being honest with you, right? Five G is my last G. He said that the last time. <laughs> and for you, John? Uh, well, I, I grew up in the west west of the country in rural Ireland. Uh, I didn't grow up in Dublin. Uh, I, I grew up on a farm, a small farm. Um, so I'm a farmer's son, uh, and I also did engineering. Um, and I only realized recently that I'm still a farmer. Uh, so uh, somebody asked me to describe quickly what I, what I do. I, I grow things. Uh, so I've learned I use my engineering skills to grow things. Um, and it's probably uh, that's, that's what it's all about for me is about yeah, building things and, and helping things to grow. So I just happen to be an engineer as well, I suppose. I think that is one of the best descriptions I've ever heard for someone growing businesses. Yeah, well, it, I'm fun. Yeah, it came up recently, and I, you know, I've always wondered how I've ended up in so many different things, but they're all the kind of same thing. They're just taking something, say, from a concept, uh, putting a structure around it, and helping it grow. Um, I suppose as an entrepreneur, that's what we do anyway. Can we deep dive a little bit about this this matter? I, I, I find this fascinating. A lot of people say that you need to focus on one thing, but you're saying I do a lot of things, but they're kind of similar. Can you elaborate on that? Um, yeah. Um, I know when we were in, like, we're in food, but I, I, food is only a product, um, and other products we make, like I, I actually, one of the companies builds the whole physical cloud with servers. And for me, they're both the same product. Um, they're just a different bill of materials. There are different methodology, but there are own people, systems, processes, procedures, um, you know, um, team building, um, problem solving, same thing. But one would argue, one would argue that you are describing entrepreneurship, but one is um, a long sales cycle. One is a, a different type of B2B. One is tech, one is low tech and so on. And then people say, you're too broad i don't understand it's not focused enough for me and there's a huge discussion when talking to young entrepreneurs where people say uh, be a, a, an all-around player or you can do a lot of things or you must focus so what would you tell a young entrepreneur now well i'd argue i do focus i know people look but everybody has a different perspective um so us within our company think we're very focused and then people look at us from a different view and they say that you're I don't understand you at all. Um, but within our own organization, because we have this culture, uh, for us, we're very focused. We know we're, we're, it's all about the customer. It's simple things. It's making the product correctly and making the product on time at the right price and making a margin. Um, holding up the values of, of your company while you're doing that. And you're kind of going, it doesn't really matter what product goes through that process. Uh, the process is the same. So for us, we're... We're extremely focused, but I know people look at us from the outside and say that I just don't understand. But I think if you worked within our company, you'd, you'd see that in, within our company, we think we're the same. It's interesting. Mark, what do you think about it? Yeah, it, it's, it, I, I look at it from the, the, the point of view of, um, 
I, I'm an engineer, right? Uh, you know, but from the, from the get go, um, I, I would have considered myself commercial, not technical. Um, and, you know, so from that point of view, uh, that, that commercial knowledge that you, that you can get run, running a services bu- business, um, you know, you can transfer that knowledge over the, 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 the knowledge of, uh, how to, how to manage, how to lead people. You can transfer that, that over and you don't necessarily need to understand all of the technical aspects of, of a business and, and, you know, Absolutely, I I don't understand every technical aspect of uh, of the business that we're in. It's a highly highly technical business, but the key thing is, you know, number one, to make sure you've got the people who 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 uh, who do understand what they're doing, and number two, from my point of view, is making sure that you know how to how to commercialize what 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 they do. That's the that's the key thing. But um, but I, I and I think one of the things I've learned in EO over the last four, four or five years, when you're around a, a forum with uh, other bu- business owners, completely different type of businesses, there's huge learning in that in terms of uh, you know how you can apply um, your 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 business mind to 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 other people's issues, other people's problems. Yeah, I completely agree that at the end. Part of being an entrepreneur is doing your own thing and being in this silo. And I think the benefit most of us get from EO is saying, oh, first of all, I'm not alone. But secondly, I learn from every interaction I have with EO members. And and even hearing you guys speak now, I'm like, hmm, it's a bit different in the way you say commercialize. And I'm like, so it's not exactly a sales type of thing. It's, It's a broader sense of that, that aspect, which I think is very, very interesting. Is it when you meet young entrepreneurs, would you say today that they're more focused on certain things? Did you, or would you say that today is, I meet a lot of indie hackers, right? They do everything. They develop, they sell, they do the content by themselves and everything. Um, Would you think that's a good way to move forward, doing everything by yourself until you figure it out? find your strengths or um, strengthen your weaknesses maybe? Well, the, the first thing is when I meet the young entrepreneurs in, in, in EO or in Accelerator or whatever, I, I'm in awe of their energy. Um, it, it's just fantastic to see, right? And it kind of it, it kind of reminds me of the sort of energy I had was when I was in my kind of late 30s or early 40s or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, from that point of view, you, you know, they're just bursting with ideas and bursting to go different directions. And they're not afraid. They're not afraid. And they, you know, and, you know, they especially I, I'm, I'm thinking in mind the the, the uh, accelerator guys that I was in, in, involved with because they tend to be younger. Um, and, you know, I was learning from them. I was learning from from, from them in, in terms of. Uh, you know the the way they 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 think out ideas and you know not afraid to fail would be the 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 the, the thing that I would uh, I, I would see with them, which was fantastic to see. You know, John, what do you think? Um, I suppose in my own journey, I, I would have been even though I'd be seen as a risk taker, I didn't take as much risk as people take today. Um, fear of failure was always. Uh, sitting on my shoulder and that there was a, a mortgage to be paid, a livelihood to be earned. You could risk a certain amount, but, but you couldn't be reckless or you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't go all in. Um, uh, I never wanted to, and, and that's the way I operated. So it was, you gamble a little bit, but you would never gamble an awful lot. Um, you had to make a living at the end of the day. And, you know, I grew up in the eighties and nineties and, uh, times were not that were not that good, and if I was to to be reckless with 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 my education, with being a young engineer, um, the whole of society would have frowned upon that. So I, I took some risk, uh, but not as much risk as as people maybe can afford to take today. So there was no fallback position for me. There was no house I could go or room I could rent or I could just you know, go back and live with my parents or that wasn't an option. When I went left the nest, the ne- I left the nest and it was, you need to make your way now on your own. Um, so uh, I think there is, there's more security in being entrepreneurial now, I think, which is a great thing. Um, and there's less stigma around failure. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think I think we look at failure now, we put it on a pedestal and we say fail, and some people forget that you actually need to succeed at some point. Yeah. And uh, we see that with a lot of entrepreneurs. They just figure it out, but nothing really happens. And so I think that, that the fountain of youth, right, is that I meet people and sometimes they give me that boost of energy. I'm not sure... Uh, uh, it solves the fear factor anymore. You know what I mean? We get to a point where we're like, yeah, I'll skip that. Too risky. Um, but in terms of enthusiasm, what do you think? Is it contagious? Uh, the enthusiasm is, I suppose, uh, if I go back to my own time again, ignorance is bliss sometimes. Um, so there weren't as many touch points. You know, there weren't as many stories of failure either. Um, now there's stories of failure everywhere. And they're so instant, you know. I mean, if you fail, somebody's writing about you an hour later. Um, when I when I failed, when, when you know, in my early years, nobody would know about it unless I told them. Give me, give me one good story about that. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, as as a young uh, manager in my early twenties, uh, I got promoted to be a plant manager at twenty six, and I got a new company car. Um, a lovely red um, uh, Toyota Corolla with spoilers and the whole lot on it. Uh, I had it six weeks and I was demoted. Uh, but I had moved to Dublin at that stage to further my career. Now, I never told anybody. And nobody ever knew. So I was allowed to, uh, to lick my wounds, learn my lesson in private, and not repeat my mistakes. Um, I'm not so sure. I think that would be on Instagram today. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem and uh you know people are people are mocking you and having a laugh at you and therefore you know my failures were private failures and in, in my early years when maybe i got above my station at 26 and i thought it was bigger than i was and smarter than i was and more you know more able than i was and somebody said to me hey john you're not as smart as you think you are you we're going to demote you and uh but i was allowed to lick my wounds in private um and learn in private uh, which i did and i learned a lot <laughs> So, so what do you think about the, the culture of uh, fake it till you make it now? What people post on Instagram, like how amazing everything is when in, in reality it's completely not and they are failing miserably. Uh, there, there's two sides to that. Um, I think you have to believe you're going to be successful even when maybe you, you have feeling you're not being. Uh, I do think that winning is a mindset and succeeding is a mindset. Uh, so is failure. Um, so... You know, I, I don't know what success is. Maybe it's not accepting failure. Um, the two of them are so close to each other. Um, um, so that, that the saying in Ireland that uh, um, a pat on the back uh, is only a short distance away from kicking the arse. And uh, I think in business, um, it's very, very fine line. People celebrate all the success, but I wonder do they ever realize how close to failure you run? to get that success. You know, it's not like you wake up and that guy or girl has been successful. They just touched it, a Midas touch and everything. No, no, no. I just don't tell the horror stories. I haven't seen the failure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's the way it is, I think. I, I, I think the fake, fake it till you make it uh, um, approach has taken a bit of a hit over the last two years because there's been so many public um, failings of comp- companies, and you know, it's been shown that there was an element to fake to, 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 to fake it. Um, you know, and I would think that you know, funders and investors or whatever are much more aware of it now than than they would have been because people can get carried with the momentum of of a story, and and people people go you know go with stories and there's you know, uh, FOMOs involved and all of that sort of for, sort of stuff. So, you know, I, I think there's there's been a bit of a, um, you know, fake it till you make it has, has got a bit of bad press over the last couple of years. Yeah, I tend, I tend to agree. I, um, I heard this podcast about David Bowie and at some point they went to the US and the band was so poor that they couldn't afford taxis. So they borrowed money and 
uh, hired limousines and bodyguards. So everything thought everybody thought they were so successful, so they booked them. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm just reading the book um, Bono from U2's autobiography, and he says at a certain point, everybody said you're really nice, but we won't sign you. So they left London and booked um, a venue, the biggest stadium they could find that they could afford in Dublin, and then people said wow, they don't even have a contract and already they're filling up stadiums. Yeah. In reality, they have like 200 people to come there. Yeah, yeah. So the fact that we make it could be, I think, a lot of things, um, which I think is, is, I agree with you. So what what excites you? You've been doing this for quite a while. Yeah. <laughs> um, you caught me there. A growing up. <laughs> that's that's part of what we do here on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We yeah. ask the tough questions. Uh, I like to see new talent. I like to see young people growing. Um, um, at this stage, a little bit of it is about a, a legacy. Um, um, it is about uh, watching and, and, and observing things grow, stuff you've planted. You know, I, my farming analogies again, so what... So things that have been, you know, uh, businesses that were small, see them grow into stability, see people take on ownership, uh, people grow into roles. Um, so that that excites me. Um, um, the next phase for me, I suppose, is, is retirement. Um, and it, 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 it excites me to watch the business transferring again. Mark? Yeah, I... I I think some, something similar in, in that uh, I, I, I love being involved in, you know, new projects, even, even you know, connected to, the, to, to our business. You, you know, we've got a, a solar business within telecoms running now, and we've also got a tower manufacturing business r- running local, locally here when we, when we kind of identified that supply chains from uh, the Far East, we're, we're, we're going to be under pressure. And both of those businesses are only, you know, a year and a half old. And, you, you know, I'm enjoying, I'm actually enjoying being part of those two small businesses. You know, even though they're only 10% of our, of our, of our main business, um, I'm enjoying, you know, running and being involved with them with other people um, more than, you know, the operational uh, um, aspects of running the, the 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 mothership, for want of a better word, you know. I think as you get older, um, you want to pull away from operations. You want to pull away from the day the day to day, and y- you know you want to be thinking more more strategically strategically. And you know, especially with the with with, with solar, I, I see you know huge opportunities within 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 solar in, in the telecoms industry, and that's something that we're that, that we're looking at and. That gets me out of bed in the morning. I'm going to do something very selfish because we have a lot of things to talk about. But I would like to pick your brains, the both of you, when it comes to dividing your time between all the things you're doing uh, in comparison to establishing a new company. So you guys have built something, an operation, and then what are the kind of, you can walk me through the steps. Are you hiring a CEO and then you're moving. Are you doing something else? Uh, well, for me, I, I have three business units, um, and what I'm building is uh, general managers. They're not CEOs, but general managers to be able to run the whole business on a day-to-day basis, um, putting in all the controls and KPIs and and and, and measurements and systems and procedures, so that I can get you know, um, a list of KPIs on a daily, weekly basis that tell me what's going on, uh, but that I'm not required for any day-to-day uh, decision-making at all. Um, and that allows me then to explore. Uh, and I, do, I, I most of my life now is exploring, exploring new opportunities. So the first, so if interrupting, the first business, you put everything in place, you build it, you scale it, you put someone and then you went to explore? Uh, probably started the other ones before that uh, because it's hard to know whether you have a business or not sometimes. Um, sometimes um, we were always growing something when something was getting established. Um, some of the things didn't work out and some of them did. It's only when they got to the point where they were starting to become established that did I put in a permanent structure on top of them. Um, 
um, but then made them independent and give them auto- autonomy and power and um, you know it became an oversight role then rather than a day to day role um, and then I go on to explore again because I suppose what I've learned at this stage is that most new business comes from relationships um, it doesn't come from operational and someone said to me once uh, and, and I'm the CEO someone said to me once that, that I have a responsibility to explore for all my staff to create opportunities for them um, to create new business units, to create new clients, new 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 opportunities. So, if I'm not out exploring, um, then I'm letting down my team. So, you know, my role has changed from operational to explorer, and now I need to you know turn over opportunities that give opportunities back to teams that have been extremely loyal to me. So, my role has changed in that regard. So, I spend most of my time now exploring, not not necessarily doing. Mark, how do you perceive the same thing? Yeah, um, you know, when you start, uh, when you start up first, like we did in 1999, and you know, four or five people for the first few months, and then you grow it, you grow it, and at max, like we were at about 130 people, we're back down to about 75, 80 now. But you know, there's a team there that will that, that have been with me. Um, some of them well over 15 years and and I've got they got I've got three key people running the the business from an or, uh, an operational and commercial point of view um they're shareholders in the business and um so you know because giving them a sense of ownership is very important um and that allows me to to basically focus on uh you know the business development and dealing with the customers at, at, at high level. But, you know, I do get dragged back into, in, in, into situations as I, as I say to them, when we mess up, I'm the one who has to go and apologize, you know, so I don't think you ever get away from that. Right. But, um, and then the structure over in Malaysia is that there's a, a team of 11 or 12 people and I have a partner over there who's a shareholder as well. Um, and, um, you know, I would be talking to them on a, a daily or, 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 you know, three times a week basis. But essentially, they run the company over over there, um, you know, because you can't run it operationally from from here. But communication is is extremely good. But um, and I'm over there every five, five or six weeks. Um, but again, operationally, they make all the calls calls o- o- over there, and I'm just kind of oversighting, you know. How complicated is it to keep in touch with them, like time differences and stuff like that? Um, well, normally what would happen is that there's eight hours difference now. They're eight hours ahead. So normally when when, when I jump into the car at 7, 7.30 or whatever, my first call is over, is over to uh, is, is to Malaysia on group WhatsApp, right? And, you know, I can talk to them for 20 minutes or whatever or – or as, as, as Zoom, scheduled Zoom calls or whatever. So, you know, I'd be talking to, to um, the financials twice a week and operations three or four times a week. But, you know, fairly close co- close, close communication um, every, every uh, on a weekly basis, you know. So uh, yeah. it's, it's always interesting, right? Like we're now complaining about the eight hour differences so um, they finish when we start but 20 years ago how did people communicate oh you know you know it's it's uh well and, and apart from the fact that you, you know a whatsapp call is essentially free you know whereas you know before whatsapp you know we were we were all roaming or whatever you know but um but the team over there do do point point out nor that uh you know, I wasn't over there for two and a half years for COVID, and um, they 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 never let me forget that that was the best two years that the company had from a, from a profitability point of view. So I think they were trying to tell me something, you know. And you didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, sometimes I think would love to hear your thoughts. Um, going back to paid global calls is not a bad thing, you know, because then people call you on WhatsApp and they drag the conversation for 25 minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What do you think about long meetings? How do you control the, the time spent on meetings? 
Yeah, I don't know. I think the meetings have got longer in the last couple of years because of uh, Zoom and people were working from home and there's nothing better to do than make an hour meeting out of a 10 minute meeting. And all these, uh, it was so easy to schedule meetings. So people schedule three meetings a week and <laughs> you're suddenly you're looking at your, your, your um, calendar and there's like 15 meetings scheduled. You wonder how you ever survived and you're meeting about meetings, about meetings, about meetings and people are talking not not about business, even on calls. It's all social and it's all mixed smack. And, and I think slowly but surely, uh, now people are saying, hang on now, just because you can book a Zoom call doesn't mean we're going to do one. So I think people are starting to fight that back again. And the other thing I, I noticed is that it was okay to, to extend everybody's working hours. And, uh, you know, can we do Zoom at seven o'clock in the evening? Sure, what else would you be doing? Sure, you're locked in your house. We book you at eight o'clock and nine o'clock and kind of, you know, and you know, you're kind of going, so the days, the, the start and, and end of the day seems to have got destroyed. Um, and I think there is an expectation now that you're meant to take a Zoom call at any time of the day. There is no home time. Um, so, but there is a pushback against that now. There, and it's, there's good reason for it. I think it, it's got too casual. What do you think about uh, work from home? Should people go back to working five days a week from the office? Should they stay, uh, I don't know, two, three days? What do you think? It, it depends. So I heard a funny story of, yeah. a, of, of a van driver assistant uh, fighting with his uh, employer to say why he, why he couldn't work from home. <laughs> um, so I so said, like, and he was a helper on a van. And you're kind of going, mm, not sure if you can work from home. So I think it's very much... Um, there is certain work, and I even myself now I find is that there are days when it suits, and if I go home and people don't interrupt me and I don't accept book calls, I get a lot of work done. Um, so it has a place definitely now, um, but then work has a place too, and uh, team, and especially young team, and um, I have I have younger kids, so I, like I have kids in their in their mid twenties, and I even uh, my eldest is in his early thirties, and 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 they're they're both in middle management roles, and they complain to me all the time that their senior managers are not at work, and uh, there's no one to learn off. Um, they're not learning to read body language. They're not learning to read a meeting room. They're not learning to read uh, how to win um, a negotiation how to how to you know to to work with various degrees of people how how to convince people how to convince people with your argument because um they need to learn off somebody but uh it's more so the older i think the the 45 years and older don't want to go back to work um and i see a lot of younger 25 and 30 year olds who want to learn off of senior people and they're not being given that opportunity so I think that's a problem. I think from, from our point of view, um, we worked through the pandemic because the majority of, of, of our teams were, were on the road um, in terms of mobile telecoms. But since then, uh, you know, the office-based staff have had a working from home uh, um, agreement, for want of a better word, you know, either two days in or, 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 or three days in. But... One of the things that, that that we've done, which I believe is priceless, is, is that we we give everybody the flexibility of the second day, but the first day is Tuesday. So everybody's in the office on Tuesday. And, you know, we would have a big what we call project management room, um, which is capable of taking, you know, 10, 11 people very comfortably. And, you know, you watch the dynamic of that when people are in the room and the communication that goes between them. And, you know, you know, and it's all informal communication. It's not Zoom meetings like what's happening with this, what's happening with that. People given given an opinion and it's absolutely priceless stuff because, you know, my office is just off that room and I listen and I hear, you, you know, you know what's said. And, and, you know, there's no way that that can be repeated on Zoom or it can be repeated from having somebody, you know, uh, at, at working from home. So, you know, that's to me, that's that's the really important day where, you, you know, all the teams are in and, you know, people who are working on Project A hear about what's going on on Project B and all of this sort of stuff, you know. So uh, that's really important. Um, and and I, I think while working from home has worked for, for employees, there's, there's, uh, there's definitely a case that in, in, in some instances it always hasn't worked for the businesses. 
Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, making me think about different stuff about that. Um, and then community-wise, we were discussing a little bit. Can you share a little bit about the project you guys have initiated? And I'd love to, to ask you some stuff about it. Well, um, it, it kind of got started uh, after the, the, the war broke, up, broke out um, uh, earlier, earlier this year. Um, there was a big a surge of of, of um, a surge within people in, in in Ireland to try and help out, right? And and part of that was to, you know, to um, to gather up perishable foods, toiletries, all that sort of, sort of stuff, um, and you know, donated in do, donated in 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 Dublin in collection centres in, in in Dublin, and basically get get it out to 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 Ukraine. Where are the Ukraine Poland border? Because at that time they thought that the refugee problem was really going to be along the border, and uh, you know the transport, the big transport companies uh, really rolled it, rolled in on this, and 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 they provided the the sort of uh, forty foot articulated transport that w- that was needed. So um, where I kind of got involved was that you know we have a lot of vans on the road and. Um, we were asked to basically support collection collection sites in in, in South Dublin, and get uh, get get this um, th- these donations to a central point to allow them to allow them to be transported. So, um, as part of that, uh, I I met with a number of Ukrainian uh, people who were living in Dublin and had lived in the, in Dublin in the in the long term. Um, who were very connected with with the with the uh, Ukrainian embassy in Ireland, and so we kept doing that for for um, for, for two or three weeks, and then um, I, I put it out to, on my work on LinkedIn, on, on my on my work network, on, on my social network, um, saying, "Look, we are doing these collect- collections, and you know, um, people were, were were very generous." But when I put it on the EO network, um, I got. Uh, a, a fantastic reaction from my fellow EOs in Ireland. You know, we're, we're a small chapter. There's only about four, forty people. But when I reached out to say, look, um, I, you know, I was involved in, 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 in doing this in terms of uh, collecting uh, and aid, of, uh, aid of all different different types, and I got a great reaction from 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 EO. Um, someone in the form of, you know basically giving me aid literally on a pallet ready to go and some of it in terms of you know what can I do in terms of, of, of supporting you from a, from a cash point of view and uh, you know to the extent that I, I, I have to be careful taking in the cash donations and I had to be very um, you know sure about what I was doing on that so I was able to get um, one, of the, one of the big retailers in Ireland to be able to take the donations directly Buy, you know, big quantities of, of, of aid and get that onto a forty foot container to go in. So, um, one of the phone calls I got on, and I, I remember it well, on one morning was was from John Cunningham, and he said to me, and I knew John well, but I didn't really know exactly what what businesses he, he was in, and he said uh, we manufacture uh, a special medical need food, and I think we can do. Uh, 20,000 servings and I said okay that's that's great thanks very much but not really understanding you know what this food was right three hours later he rang me back and he said I think we can do 50,000 servings and then two hours later after that he rang me back and he said I think we can do 100,000 and I said hold on a minute here we need to you know need to see what what what, what, what we're doing here you know so um you know, let, let John explain to you exactly what what the what the what the food is, and and you know, come back then and say how, how we got it to where it needed to be. Um, I suppose to put a context on all of this, um, uh, our food company had, had just experienced three of the worst years in its living history, um, and as a business, we were we were on our knees. Um, but like all these things, uh, Mark rang me and we were talking and saying that's fair enough, but there are people worse off. <laughs> and uh, it's kind of like, okay, so 
part of part of the reason and, and the kind of energy behind this was this sense that okay, uh, business is tough and everything is tough, but maybe we need to just dig deep and go do something special. Um, and the EORs call it a big, 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 hairy, audacious goal. Go and do this thing. Um, stop, feeling, stop feeling sorry for your current situation in business and go do something positive and maybe something will come out of that. Um, and actually for finish something really positive came out um, for us as a business. Uh, but in that time it was about, okay, we can do this, so we should do this. Um, so I rang all my, my suppliers and said, right guys, um, I didn't tell Mark, but I said, right, we're going to do a quarter million, are you in for, can you give me materials? Um, and in fairness, every single one of them donated an uh, open phone. I knew what I was looking for, it was like a shopping basket for me. I rang all the big, big, my big, big suppliers and said, I'm looking for two tons of this, two tons of that. It was like making a cake. Um, and they donated over the phone. I said, you need documentation, you need, so no, I don't need them. Uh, and then he, as, he, as each donation was coming in to me, I was ringing Mark back and said, we're up to 50,000, we're up to 100,000, maybe we can make more for me. And he said, whoa. So he said, uh, we're calm. I said, no money required. We can we can do this thing. Um, people are donating. Um, it's all about, and I've said this to Mark since, it was about trust. Myself and Mark, the one thing I suppose people trusted us. Um, and in that time of maybe no rules, um, the first thing was, can we, can we trust these guys? Um, and people trusted us. Uh, people donated money, cash, components, and the short story, we, we built a, a product with that because we were on in-house product development and we were able to take what we got and build it into a food for special medical purposes, which we did in 24 hours. Um, and we produced the product and we shipped the first 40 foot, which was a quarter of a million servings. Um, the big thing for me was, uh, again, I find the manufacturing very straightforward, but the big concern was, would we ever be able to get this to people who needed it? Um, and that's where it could all fall. And that's where Mark came on board and, and he made sure that the product was, and it was actually delivered directly into hospitals in the Ukraine. And it was validated um, with photographs, letters, drivers, the whole lot. We got all the sort of tactile stuff that you needed, videos, everything to show people what, that the product had got to where it was needed to get to. Um, so the, 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 I think part of that on it was that that, that the, the little bit of panic that I had when John said he was up to a hundred or two hundred and fifty thousand on it was, you know, to make sure that this got to the right place. And uh, totally coincidentally, at the same time, my my sister works for um, NGOs such as the Red Cross or whatever, and she was on the Poland Ukraine border, and I was talking to her, and you know, apart from the chaos that was all over there, the aid that was being collected in Ireland. That's where it was ending up. It was ending up on the border. And and yes, some of that aid ended up in the wrong place. And yes, some of it ended up in, 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 a, in, in a dump or whatever. But, you know, the way that the NGO, NGO organizations look at it, that, OK, if 60 percent of it gets to where it needs to be, it's still worth doing. You know, so I went back to uh, my Ukrainian contact who had very was it was a very good relationship with the Ukrainian ambassador in Ireland. And when I said to them that we had this food stuff that would be uh, very beneficial in hospitals, rather than us arranging the transport, the the embassy arranged the transport. So the so the the truck that came up was procured by the uh, by the embassy and paid for by the embassy. So we never ended up paying for the transport. So we knew at least we knew that that the, that that um, the Ukrainian government essentially were behind the transport. And that gave us the confidence because, as John said, a lot of people had donated. John had, had done what he'd done. You really wanted to make sure that it ended up in, in, in the right place. So, um, you know, there was a time after the first load left that we we were concerned, watching to make sure that we could get evidence that it actually ended up in the right place. Interesting. How can you encourage people? Can you encourage people to do more, be more like you, uh, uh, donate, help, or is it something that you either are or you aren't? Well, well just, just to finish that story, I suppose, we, the first load was, was, was all uh, 
nothing was defined. We're in no man's land. There are no rules. We're in a war zone, actually, trying to deliver product into a war zone where there are no rules. And the rules were changing every day and the risk profile was changing every day and, and nobody was quite... Uh, but and, and Mark and the team managed to deliver the product directly into hospitals, uh, five, six hospitals in the, in the Ukraine, which was amazing. Um, then um, a large customer came on board and donated 50% uh, of the ingredients for a second load. Uh, we delivered that then a couple of months later. And then another big benefactor came on board and paid for two full loads. So we've ended up shipping four 40 foot loads, one million uh, meal um, packs, um, and the total contributed voluntarily to this at the moment is just short of a quarter of a million euros. Um, so for us, I was saying to Mark, that first one was like all these things, whether it's it's just entrepreneurship is the first time through, nobody knows what you're doing. You're kind of, this is the faking till you make it bit. Mm -hmm. You know, we got this. We're trusting ourselves, but we're not quite sure. We're doing all the right things, but it mightn't work. Um, but it did work. And then people said, okay, so now you've done the first one, we're in for the second one. And then the second one, now you've done two, we're in for three. And now the three, we're in for four. So the fourth one only shipped uh, two weeks ago. Um, but like that, the first one uh, challenged everybody. There was trust, there was money, there was risk, there was unknown uncertainties. But it, Mark and myself are both engineers. So that doesn't, uh, there's a way. Um, and it's not like we were following any known route. We didn't really know what we were doing, if the truth be known. Uh, other than that, if anyone could do it, we could probably do it. And so we did. So again, I, I could not have done this without Mark. And Mark probably couldn't have done no. this without me. Uh, but the two of us could do it. And you, this is, we'll go back to what you said earlier about sometimes about doing it on your own. Uh, on my own, it would have been aspirational. Uh, but together, actually, I couldn't do that front end piece. I could never deliver that product to the Ukraine, never in a million years. So uh, I would only ever be able to do half of it, which would, would have, which would have been none of us. We've started by talking about young people and how we can learn from them. And I think we're wrapping up with, with the, the concept of how inspiring um, hearing you guys talk. And if I put this podcast in front of a young audience, they will say, I can also do big things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so I, I want to say thank you. I think it's, it's, I'm hearing you guys speak and in the last, I don't know, 40 minutes, I think uh, I can scale my businesses better. I, I think I can inspire people to grow. I think um, I can inspire people to do more for the community. I think I've gotten more inspiration in the last 40 minutes with you guys than I've gotten in the last 10 books I've read. So thank you. You're welcome. It's Thank you. Problem. Last words before we wrap up, uh, um, something you want to leave with the young entrepreneurs that will listen or watch this episode. Uh, I, I would say to young entrepreneurs uh, as they, you know, go through their business uh, lives or whatever, is that always keep in the back of their head that there's always an element of giving back. Um, because even though entrepreneurship can be very, very tough at times and very lonely at times, um, it, 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 it's, it, it's a, a very, not privileged, but very lucky, unique place to be. And, uh, you, know, should, you know, we should all look for the opportunity uh, to give back where, where, where we can give back. And it's not even in terms of, writing a check or money, but just giving back in terms of time, giving back in terms of expertise. Um, I suppose my thing, my thing is to ask and to talk to people. Like, I think there is a perception that, you know, these established business people won't talk to you. They won't share with you. Uh, they won't share their experience. And my, what I found is that they will. Uh, they don't, they are, you know, I, I think if I was saying to young entrepreneurs, reach out to people, ask people for a cup of coffee, ask people for advice, um, ask people for guidance. Um, there should never be any money involved. Uh, the best advice comes freely. Um, and I would say it's rare for somebody with experience not to appreciate getting to where they've got to. And very few of them I've ever seen would refuse help. 
to a young entrepreneur. So if it was me, I'd say be daring and ask. Ask. I'm always reminded that we can learn from every person we meet along the way if we're only open enough to see what they can give us. And I want to say a, a huge thank you for being here. Uh, John and Mark, first of all, thank you. And secondly, I want to say to the audience and people watching us on YouTube or any other channel, feel free. If you want something, you need something, reach out to us. As you can see, there's always something to learn from someone. Um, I feel so blessed sometimes to be part of the CEO network and, and the fact that we get to see and meet these people. I want to say thank you for everyone that is part of this show, helping and supporting us. Um, and thank you very much. John and Mark, I will visit you soon because I think we need to have coffee together. Okay. So thank you for this.